Hello everybody, it's me Ghost Critic and it's time for a Sunday comic book review video. I'm a bit stuffed up at the moment, I think I'm starting to feel the effects of all the colds and the flus that are going around my office. I'm trying to battle it with as much medication as possible so sorry about my nasally and probably coughing a lot throughout this video. I'll do my best. Uh, this week I've got about five or six comics to talk about and as usual, as we all know, I'll be talking about storylines within the comic books, cliffhangers, all that stuff. So spoilers, if you've not read any of these books, please uh, stop the video when you see a comic that you haven't read yet. Uh, go off and read it, come back or just forward fast the... Um, Fast forward the video and uh, go on to the next one and come back later. Um, I'm kicking off with a book that I'm still not sure whether it came out last week or this week, but I'm glad I ended up picking it up and it is going to go on my pull list. It's a four issue miniseries from Dark Horse and uh, the new Burger Books imprint. It is Hungry Ghosts. And this is an absolutely fantastic premise for one of those kind of spooky anthology series that you get. Um, the basic plot line that goes through it and um, that kind of puts all these stories together is that we have this kind of hugely wealthy man. We don't know how he's got his money, but we know he's wealthy. He's having this dinner party and he invites all the kitchen staff to come and join them at the end of the meal. And he, he explains this concept of Kaidan. Now, Kaidan, um, and this is another part, why I love this book so much, there's so much kind of Eastern and kind of Oriental type um, mythology and, and kind of, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? It'll come to me. Um, but it's got that feel to it, that culture. That's what I was thinking of, culture. And Kaidan is this uh, concept where we have a room it's filled with 100 candles and a mirror and people go into the room, tell a scary story and blow one of the current candles out, look into the mirror and as long as you see your reflection and not some demon, you haven't been possessed and you kind of, I guess, get to go free. And apparently as the candles start going uh, more and more out and it gets darker and darker, the stories have to get a lot scarier. And if you uh, kind of disgruntle this demon, then you will be possessed by them. And so we have these two short stories where um, we get some chilling kind of spooky uh, ghost and monster stories and it just it's just really good and um, the first story is kind of like the cautionary tale uh, where you should always help your fellow man the second story is like a, a pirate story with a maiden rescued but of course each story comes with a kind of macabre twist um, and I'm sure it's going to satisfy any fans of kind of the horror or the ghost stories kind of genre. The artwork in here by Alberto Ponticelli and Vanessa Del Rey um, wonderfully evoke the uh, the scary stylings of this um, of this tale. Uh, I don't want to try and pick um, obviously some of the best pictures because um, I don't want to reveal huge plots, huge twists, but um, <clears throat> it's just a fantastic book. To be honest, given this is only a four-issue mini-series, this actually has the potential to go on that much longer, given the premise of there are a hundred candles. We should be getting a hundred stories. And maybe they're just testing the water and we will see future series that are longer than just this four-issue mini-series. But I would love this to be an ongoing. And because it was so good... And just because I'm not sure whether it still came out this week or last week, I'm still giving this my pick of the week. Yes, I'm going there. Top of the video, I'm giving you my pick of the week. Go and support this book, Hungry Ghosts, from Dark Horse, from the Burger Books imprint. Uh, Karen Berger of Vertigo editing this whole um, kind of side imprint of Dark Horse. I think this is going to be uh, a little bit special. 
uh, for all us kind of horror buffs that like the the stories that you kind of find in in eerie and creepy and to some extent perhaps um, heavy metal. But um, I love this. I, I hope we see some different artists as well as uh, Ponticello, um, but some new artists in there as well would be great stuff. So apparently the hot book to get this week and I was um, kind of got drawn into that whole hype was for Swamp Thing Winter Special. Um, this being a one-off. But after reading this 80-page um, giant at uh, a giant price of 7 99 I was actually incredibly disappointed with this, especially obviously with the price. Essentially, this is two stories, and we are pushing it at that. Um, we're kicking off with an overly long tale by uh, Tom King, where Swamp Thing is struggling across a snowy landscape, protecting this young boy. And quite honestly, it doesn't take very long for the reader to work out what the twist in this tale is. Every encounter that um, Swamp Thing apparently has with this monster that's following them, he instantly forgets the next day. Um, <clears throat> and the, the urgency of the boy to keep going, it's just so obvious. Uh, and Tom King is so much better than this. Um, the art by Jason Fabok saves this tale, um, but really only just. And let's get on to that backup story. It was, quite honestly, an abysmal tribute to Len Wein. I'm not buying this pretentious drivel that written down by the editor um, Rebecca Taylor or the fact that you get the script the base of the script for what was going to be the full uh, comic because basically this is just a series of pages of Kelly Jones story. Now I quite understand that artwork can tell a story without any words being on it However, this is not the case here. You don't know what the hell is going on for most of this time. And it's because Len Wein was a master wordsmith. He evoked atmospheres and environments and just wonder that it needed to be there. <clears throat> I would rather have had a classic... Len Wein's story from bygone years as the backup story here. I was expecting that, but to get this wordless half a story that was supposedly going to be an ongoing from the last Swamp Thing that the two wrote, no, it wasn't good enough. And then to add insult to injury, to whack a 7 99 price tug on this is a I was so, so disappointed with this book because I was really looking forward to having a good, meaty, Swamp Thing story to read. This wasn't the case. Let's move on to Paper Girls, issue number 20. And by the end of this issue, we see the girls actually moving off to the future, like our future. But you're kind of left wondering what, if anything, has really happened in this last story arc. <sighs> Vaughn is really starting to stretch my patience with this book. Um, and, the, and the double humility of this book is that it's now on hiatus till June. <sighs> I get... And I've said myself that this is a great character piece. We're developing um, these four characters uh, and making them believable and real in this impossible scenario. But really, at its core, Paper Girls is a sci-fi comic. 
And those moments that you get, those pool future shenanigans, they're just like too few and far apart. And when you do get that excitement that rises and you go, oh, something really good's happening, then you have to wait like three, four months for the payoff that just never seems to come because that high has gone. It's been, it's gone, it's left the building, it's gone on holiday, come back got married, had babies, grown old and died and then it's come back. <sighs> I know I should stop. It sounds like I'm really down on this book. Paper Curls has been good. I've enjoyed it. But there's not enough meat on this comic's bones. And it's so disappointing. And I want to read this. And partly my whole issues with issues is that I can't now go to trade on this. I, I can't mix trades and single issues up. It, it's a strange affliction I have but I just can't do it and I need to have either one or the other and so I'm sticking with it. <coughs> I don't know how much longer this book has got to go but something has to happen. Let's quickly move on to Daredevil issue 598 where I can calm down a little and actually have a book that's doing well. Can you believe it? Uh, yes, uh, the fallout of this new vi of our new villain Muse um, escaping from prison escalates in this issue as he's um, skipping around um, the Devil's Kitchen with his kind of politically jabbed graffiti art um, that he's postering up all around the city. So you get, you've had the I am not a crook with Daredevil um, on the side of huge building. You've now got Spider-Man, Iron Fist, She-Hulk and Luke Cage plastered up on there. And of course Mayor Fisk is not happy. I'm not quite sure how he doesn't know about Muse um, after the storyline that he was in where he was creating all those macabre pieces of artwork out of um, Inhumans and the like. It would have been a big story surely uh, and surely Wilson would have known about this uh, being, you know, a crime lord of the underworld. However, he doesn't. He gets filled in. Maybe it's all the um, the pressures of being a a mayor now, because he's up uh, and getting his kind of cabinet, his heads of department set up. The twist on it is that all these heads of department he's picking are in themselves uh, villainous or, or, or outright villains. So you've got Hammerhead, you've got Black Cat, you've got the Owl and you've got Diamondback. And it really feels like he's Charles Sewell is bringing back the, the real classic characters for Daredevil to go up against. Um, he's really amping up the danger here for Daredevil um, as we get up to the run up to kind of issue 598. Of course, the downfall of this, because the whole of, of the city is now kind of thinking, oh, well, maybe the mayor's wrong. And, you know, these vigilantes aren't as bad as our mayor is. Um, is making out. But of course Muse is a crazy mother. Let's go as far as that. And he may have just given the mayor a way to turn this all around as while he's uh, doing his latest piece of graffiti art uh, with the Punisher as his subject, he ends up killing a bunch of cops, which of course leads um, or gives the mayor an opportunity to turn things around and make Muse a danger rather than uh, a sympathiser. But it's been a really, really good book. I've really liked this turn that uh, Daredevil has made. And, <clears throat> you know, they might only be uh, portraits on a wall, but it's nice to have that element of other superheroes belonging in this universe as well and all those great villains that I love from Daredevil's past 
being pushed forward. Um, I'm, I can't wait to see what uh, Charles Sewell is going to kick off um, with issue 600. Um, I just made Daredevil's life all the more awkward and dangerous. It's I Hate Fairyland, issue number 16. Yes, she's back. Gertrude, our unwilling main protagonist. We found her being dropped into hell at the end of the last story arc before it took a, a brief hiatus. And all you have to ask ourselves, what mayhem is she going to cause down in hell? Well, not a great deal really, as we have this devil, this demon, um, try to throw all kinds of, uh, of torture her way. Um, this lineup of baddies that she's already been up against and she's just finding it kind of tiresome and boring and come on you can do better than that uh, um, you know it's kind of yauntsome to her um, Gertrude is just completely not impressed and I love her attitude to this uh, full-on danger of having uh, a real kind of demon devil up against her um, so our kind of demon has to take a different tack um, to torture her. So instead of throwing all these villains and potential fights her way, he gives her what she wants, a way home. And so she goes home. And of course, this is one huge big trick by the demon. Everything is all fluffy and great. And she's very happy to see her parents. And she can't believe her luck. And they're sitting down at the kitchen table. But of course, this is an illusion. And it's uh, it just goes very, very badly. But it doesn't matter what choice of torture uh, the demon chooses. Um... Nothing is phasing Gertrude anymore. There is just, however, one last torture that the demon has up its sleeve. What thing could possibly push Gertrude over the edge um, and just hopefully turn her crazy? How about the one thing she's been trying to escape from for the whole entire series? Yes, the demon sends her back to fairyland. This book is just fantastic. The imagination from Scotty Young is fantastic. We've got the goofiness, we've got the adult humour, we've got the cartoon violence, and it's just fun all the way. It's a hilarious jaunt through this world. And I just love Scotty Young. He is a fantastic creator. And long may this uh, comic book title continue. Finally this week, it's Gravedigger's Union, issue number four. I have to say, there is still a lot to love about this title. Uh, we've got that, in every issue we've had this kind of weird alien type beginning of each issue taking place at what is, I guess, essentially the dawn of man. Um, clearly these have links to what, is what has happened and what is going on in the main storyline. The supernatural element obviously is right up my alley. Uh, with each issue there just seems to be uh, more introductions of the supernatural, whether they be vampiric, werewolf, zombies. In this issue we have this ghost storm that's uh, wreaking havoc along the Florida coastline. Um, our grave diggers coming together um, in this kind of research mode. Yes, some of them have got some slight reservations about where they're going to have to go. Some of them are mistrustful, especially regarding the, uh, the witch that's joined the group. And then there's the kind of slightly mystical side of it, um, hold enchanted swords, the dark cults that are going to release these dark gods. All that whole package just fills me with glee and I just can't wait to open another issue of Grave Diggers. However, unfortunately there's a however with this book. I am struggling to get on board now with Toby Cypress's artwork. Um, I just wish it was Wes Craig. Maybe that's it. Uh, I, I really enjoy Wes Craig's artwork, you know, on Deadly Class. It's just his first few pages here. Great stuff. Toby's artwork is just a bit... 
leaning towards the rough side, the sketchy side, the unfinished product, uh, and maybe just needs sharpening up a touch. The, the whole chosen one, the, the one person that's going to lead this dark cult bit, it, the story is a little bit trite, it's a little bit unoriginal. It kind of reminds me of something that's going on in the realm, but I'm so not with the realm at the moment, and obviously I've dropped the realm. Um, but something about this makes me feel the same way as I do about the realm. But this is just this is just enough for me to go. Yes, there's enough good stuff in it to blinker out the the bad stuff. So <clears throat> while I am still enjoying it. There are faults with it, I can see those, um, but I'm going to look forward to the future issues. I don't see this going and turning and crossing that line where it could be a really bad comic. Uh, I think there's enough good stuff on this to keep me going till the bitter end, however long Wes and Toby want to go with this. <coughs> And that's it for me this week while well, I just clear my throat. I'm very sorry about um, my voice. Uh, so it only leaves me to say thank you all for watching. Uh, please comment down in the boxes below. Let me know what you've been reading, what you think of the books that I've been reading. Give this video a big thumbs up. And if you're not yet subscribed, please do so. Then you won't miss out on any more of my videos. Next week is going to be a bit sketchy video wise I'm not sure what's going to go up and when's going to go up because I've got three days off and I won't be here at home with my comics and my comic book store just down the road unfortunately so I'll see you when I see you I hope you enjoyed your comics and goodbye